My name is Paul E. Bombardier. My last name is spelled B-O-M-B-A-R-D-I-E-R. Bombardier. Bombardier. Is there any it's ethnic a, origin of? It's, a, it's French of French origin. My uh, ancestors came from Belgium in northern France and to Quebec and then, then to the United States back in the early, uh, the late 1800s. And uh, my father was born in Quebec. My mother was born in Massachusetts. And uh, I, was, I was born there in Massachusetts and raised. When were you born? I was born in uh, May of 1932. May of? May 14, uh -huh. 1932 in North Adams, Massachusetts. North? Adams, uh -huh. Massachusetts. So, there was around the year of Great Depression, wasn't it? It was born, it, my, it was after the Depression had started. My parents married two weeks before the Great Depression in 1929. Mm -hmm. And uh, they struggled through the Depression. I was born in 1932. My brother was, my only brother was born in 1933. And we were raised there in Mass northwestern Massachusetts. We went to... Uh, uh, were you the oldest? I was the oldest. Mm -hmm. And uh, we were only two in my family. Mm -hmm. My parents came from large families, but we didn't have a big family. And uh, we were raised there in North Adams. We went to grade school. What school? Uh, it was the Notre Dame Catholic school. Uh -huh. It was a French uh, speaking school and I learned to speak English there. As well as my parents. My father was born in 1903 and emigrated as a child with his parents to Massachusetts from Quebec and he went to the same school and he also learned to speak English there. So do you speak French? I speak French. Could you introduce yourself and say hello to Korean people? Uh, bonjour to les personnes de Korea. Mon nom est Paul Bombardier. Beautiful. Yeah. So you speak two languages. I speak two languages. Very nice. When did you graduate? I mean, think about, please tell us, this interview will be heard by the many young kids in the school. And tell them about the days around the uh, 1929, the Great Depression. How hard was it? How did you survive and things like that? Well, as a child, I wasn't aware of the Depression. My parents worked hard at whatever they could find. And uh, the, uh, I was always fed. My brother and I were always fed. We were clothed and we went to school. And we didn't feel the effects of it. And, they didn't seem to bother us, although my parents worked, worked very hard. And uh, we were fortunate in that uh, we survived, and we survived, I think, quite well. I never felt that I was suffering at all in growing up. My days in school and uh, activities, it was, uh, it was a good childhood. Yeah. Very nice. Yeah. Graduated from grade school in 1946 and then went on to high school. 1946. 1946, and graduated from high school in June of 1950. Uh-huh, June. Weeks, two, two weeks before the action started in Korea, a country that I had never, I hadn't heard of before, didn't know where it was, and, uh, but I learned a lot from it. That's, that's my question. Did you know anything about Korea? No. Did you know anything about Asia? Very little. Very little. Tell All me. All I knew is, about, is during, growing up during the war years the, the, uh, of Japan. Mm -hmm. Japan was the talk and uh, that was the only thing. And uh, I've read newspaper articles about the Chinese and the atrocities in China. And, and the flying tigers, I, I loved airplanes, so I followed that. And, uh, but as far as knowing anything about the people, 
I didn't know anything at all. In so, Korea, I had not heard of it at all. You didn't not know all. where it located? I didn't know at all. When, when they announced that the North Korea had invaded South Korea, everybody said, well, where's Korea, you know? We just didn't know. We, we, we weren't taught that. And, uh, we just learned, but we learned fast. We learned fast. When were you in Korea? I was in Korea in, from uh, October 1952 to 19, October 1953. I was there during the, the hostilities, and uh, I returned home three months after the truce was signed. So let me ask this question. Actually, usually I ask this question at the end of the interview, but since you mentioned by yourself that you didn't know anything about Korea, now you were in Korea from October 52 to 53, and now you know about Korea, right? No, have I you been back Korea. to Korea? No, I haven't. You never been, no. but you know what's going I on in Korea. I know what's going on. I keep up to it. Yes. Tell me about this. You didn't know anything about Korea, but you were there, and now the Korea you know and the Korea you knew in 1950 is completely different. Right. Tell me about this. What do you think about this? And why were you there? And what is the outcome of your service? And what do you think about it? What is Korea to you now? Well, for, for me, two weeks after my graduation from high school, I already had a job. I had no thoughts of going to college. I, I had a job. I had a girlfriend. And uh, life was good, you know. And, uh, but the draft was in full force and uh, they were taking all the 18 to 21 year old boys and uh, the group of friends that I had, we discussed this and we didn't know, we knew we were going to go, but we didn't know when, so we decided let's just, let's go. So we all enlisted, there were five of us. We enlisted, and uh, we enlisted in the Air Force in order to stay away from the infantry, self-preservation. And uh, we processed our paperwork, and we're all set to depart. We'd, we'd given notice at our jobs. Our families had given us going away parties and bon voyage type thing. And the night before we were supposed to leave, the recruiter called and said that all Air Force enlistments were frozen. They had too many candidates. And so therefore we would not be leaving on time. Well, since we had already given up our jobs and everything, we decided let's, let's just go in the Army instead. And uh, we went down and scratched out everywhere on the forms that it said Air Force. We scratched out and put Army and initialed it and we left on time the next morning. We were in the Army. That's how we ended up. <laughs> what, let me ask this. What was the reaction of your girlfriend that when you have to go to war? Well, that was later on. At first we were just going in the Army. We didn't, some of us, we, we, we just didn't know what the future was going to bring in as far as assignments, where we would go. Some went to Korea and some went to Germany and, you know, with their different assignments. So we didn't know, but they, they, the, fa the girlfriends, the families, they hated to see us go, especially since we signed up. The draft was for two years. We signed up for three. The minimum to sign up to volunteer was three years. And so we signed up for three years. And so, so you were not actually drafted. You were no, volunteered, I was drafted. enlisted. I was, I was volunteered, yes. And all five of us. Uh, Why? Well, were you not afraid? No, no, not really. Uh, curious, but we weren't afraid. No, but we knew they were going to get us eventually, and uh, we just wanted to just go ahead and get it over with. Go, go. It might have been a year. It might have been a month till they drafted us. It depend on the luck of the draw. And uh, so we decided to just go ahead and get it over with. And three years didn't seem like such a long time. And uh, it, uh, and just, it was, I guess I would 
think that it was an adventure, something that we were going to do. And but now, looking back all those years, what is Korea to you now? Well, the Korea, you know about the modern Korea, right? I know about the and modern so Korea. And so, what yes. do you think about that? I think that's marvelous. I think it's marvelous because when I was there, it was total devastation. There wasn't a, a building in Seoul that was still whole. I think the only one that was still whole was the main PX. The Army PX in, in Seoul was the only building that had all the windows in it. Everything, even the buildings across the street were all bombed out. It was just a, <clears throat> and, and uh, I was stationed up just to the north and west of Yonchon, and uh, that was all uh, above the farm line. There were no civilians above the farm line. Any Korean above the farm line, if he wasn't in the military, was the enemy. And uh, so uh, it, it was just, back then it was just terrible, it just, just seeing it. I was fortunate in that I wasn't a uh, line soldier. I wasn't a rifleman. I was uh, an aviation mechanic on the light airplanes. And uh, I had a pretty well structured work routine in maintaining my aircraft and my unit's aircraft. And uh, I'll, I will go back to that yeah, question. Yeah. But this is going to. I mean, many school children actually is going to listening to you afterwards, okay? Mm -hmm. So could you tell us more about the specifics of the devastation that you witnessed in Korea, in Seoul, so that they can know before and after picture, because you are the only one that has before and after of Korea pictures, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Please tell more about the devastation mm -hmm. and the people, how miserable they were, how poor they were, and things like that. The, uh, the population in Seoul and out in the outlying villages was hand to mouth as far as growing. Everybody had to work. Everybody worked in children and children. From what I could see, uh, I, tra I, had to f I was fortunate to travel from my unit back to Seoul on a monthly basis. And so I was able to, to see the people there. And uh, the, uh, I can recall instances where our, our garbage would be picked up at our unit and transported to a dump location where the children would be just the, the, the military police would have to really work to keep them out of there because they were struggling to find anything that was half eaten. Uh, I, I just, um, I thought that was terrible and I never took a picture of that because I didn't want to, I just didn't want to show that to people. It, uh, it had to be terrible. It had to be terrible for them because I was, I was sleeping in a nice warm bed at night. I had my three meals a day. And here, there's these people just trying to survive. What were time. you thinking? The I mean, kids were trying to find anything to anything, eat, right? Any, anything at all, anything that was edible or usable. And uh, it, uh, I was fortunate in having two good houseboys in my tent, which we kept with us. One was only 14 years old, and the other one was 16 years old, and. Uh, I had a Sears catalog sent to me by my girlfriend, and uh, I let them pick out clothing and articles out of the catalog wow. to, to ship to them, to, to me, and to give to them. But uh, I would have liked, I would have loved to adopt them, but I wasn't married, didn't, you know, and there was no way I could do that. But I would have loved to take those two boys home. One was especially was very smart, and. Uh, the older one, he was 16, and he was so afraid that the Korean MPs would come in and grab him because there was a lot of talk about young boys being picked up off the street and put in the army. And he was so afraid that every time he saw anything that looked official, he would disappear, you know. And, and uh, but uh, it, it was uh, that part of it was terrible. So you pick up 
you ask them to pick up their favorite clothes from the catalog, from the catalog and you ask your girlfriend to send those. She would order them and send them to me, yes. So you d actually did deliver that clothes to your boss boy? Oh yes. oh, yes. Wow. Yeah, oh yeah. What a story. And the younger one wanted his, what his dream. He looked in and he found a flashlight in that catalog and it, had, it, it was about a foot long and held about four or five batteries in it. He wanted that and I ordered it for him and uh, he was tickled to death of that thing. Now, I don't know if he sold it real quick, but... Uh, did you have any picture about that with the new clothes no, from the U.S. No, for? Oh, no. that have might pictures, have been a dynamite. I have pictures of the house boys, but uh, not, not, in the, not in the civilian clothes. They wore the same fatigues that we wore. We had a custom set made for the smaller one because he was too small for our clothing. And we had a set of, of uh, fatigues made for him. So now you know the modern Korea, right? Yes, I know. Mark. What do you think about this oh. radical differences? This this is amazing. I just don't know how they could put up that many buildings in that small space. You know, it. Uh, I was fortunate in the aviation unit I was in. I was able to fly a lot with my my pilots, as and uh, I was a crew chief on, on the airplane, which was the maintenance man, and they would take me whenever they were going on business at some other airstrip or some other location. They'd take me along, and I took a lot of pictures in the air, and especially around Seoul. And I have pictures of the buildings from the ground and from the air. And uh, I, was, I was quite fortunate in the job that I had. And, uh, it, was, it, was, it was a good way to spend an, an assignment for me. So what would you tell the American kids about Korea 1950 and 21st century Korea? Uh, they wouldn't believe the difference. They just, I, I, I think I'd find it hard for the children to believe what I saw. And uh, it, uh, today of course, modern, they've got the modern trains and all. Back then they only had one track going up north from Seoul, and going up to Yonchon and up to Trowan. And, uh, and uh, we used the railroad bridge up there on Route 3 before you get to Yonchon. We used the railroad bridge to, to cross with our vehicles because the automobile bridge on the side of it was in the river. And, uh, but getting back to the children, um, that was my the biggest thing that bothered me is seeing the children in that dump foraging for food and uh, they just looked so miserable. You know, I didn't have much action with the citizens at all because I was above the farm line. But we had a uh, detail of Korean uh, labor force mm. at, our, at our location that we used for maintenance around the, around the area. And uh, one elderly gentleman, he was a grandfather, uh, and he was smart. He helped us maintain our airplanes. He was, he was mechanically inclined, and uh, he, he, was, he was a very good person. He was learning a little bit of English, and uh, you showed him how to do something, and he did it every time. You know? It They're very smart. Yes, they are. Yes, they are. Mm -hmm. uh, given the opportunity, given the opportunity, they are. And uh, let us go back to uh, the time around that you were in basic training. What was your MOS, and what did you do? Well, I started out when I when we enlisted. The recruiting sergeant gave us a story about the buddy platoon system to keep us all together. We were hoping we would all stay together instead of going off in different directions. And uh, so they wanted to know what, in, in, in our forms when we enlisted, they uh, wanted to know what we were doing in civilian life, what kind of experience we had, and they assigned your MOS according to that. But they gave us all the same one, which was a rifleman. And uh, I took my basic training with the 45th Division before it went to Korea. 
and it had just been mobilized. It was a, the Oklahoma National Guard mobilized to build up its forces and ship to Korea. And we took our infantry basic with them and I was going to be a line soldier, and I don't know what the MOS is for that, but uh, the uh, infantry basic was a 16-week course, and at the end of 13 weeks, I injured both knees on a forced march, um, and uh, I was in the hospital for 21 days, and so I missed three weeks of basic training. When I was released from the hospital, my unit was already packing up. They'd received their orders to ship out, and uh, I didn't graduate with the rest of the people, so I was transferred to another battalion on the base, and uh, which was a godsend for me, because I didn't, 45th Division took heavy casualties, and out of the five of us that enlisted, three didn't survive. And uh, one of them was my best friend, childhood from childhood all the way on up through. He was to be our best man at our wedding. The day before rotating back home, he was killed. He'd spent his year there. His year in hell, he called it. And uh, the, uh, so I was transferred to the artillery battalion and uh, they had put me in service battery because supposedly I had a def defect with both my knees. I couldn't march or anything, but I could work. So I was put in the service battery where in a service battery in an artillery battalion services the three firing batteries, A, B, and C, and headquarters battery. Uh, supplies them with ammunition on field problems, supplies them with fuel, supplies them with food for the kitchens, and just general work. That's what it is. It's a service battery. I was only there two months, though. Then I was transferred into headquarters battery, and uh, I began training as a fire control specialist for artillery. And several months into that, I received orders to go to an aircraft mechanic school. And. Uh, I didn't, at that time, I didn't even realize that the Army had airplanes. I thought the Air Force had airplanes. There was no Air Force, actually, officially. It, well, it, just, it was just beginning, you know. The Air Force had just been transferred from the Army after World War II. So I went to an airplane mechanic school for four months in San Marcos, Texas. It was an Air Force base. I'm sorry, I, I have to revise my comments that there was no Air Force Academy there at the time. There was right. Air Force, right? right. But right. still, yeah. Army had its own. It had its yes. own. It was, uh, they used small spotter airplanes, yes. and they were beginning the use of helicopters. Yep. And uh, so when I graduated from the in mechanic school, I went back to my unit in Louisiana, and uh, I was put into the transfer to the air section, and there I received my MOS, which was 3008, was Air Aviation Specialist. Aviation Maintenance Specialist, and I kept that all the way the rest of the time I was in the military. The, uh, I was there about two months after I graduated, and then I received my orders then for Korea. My initial orders were to go to Taegu, to the, K the KMAG, the Korean Military Advisory Group there, to be an instructor for the Korean troops teaching them maintenance on their aircraft. And uh, when I got to the replacement depot after landing at Incheon, we went to the, uh, I forget the name of the replacement depot, the ASCOM City it was, As ASCOM City. They looked at my orders in Tegu, you know, you go to Incheon, and Tegu, you go this way. <laughs> yep. They said, you're, you're going this way. <laughs> they uh, reassigned me to the 159th Field Artillery Battalion. And uh, at that time, the 159th was using, they had just transitioned from 105 millimeter cannon to 
155 millimeter cannon, a little bit bigger. So that brought them back from the line a little bit, so they could get a little bit further back. And uh, there's where my experience in Korea started. My first night after getting off the ship at Incheon and going to Asia. When did you arrive in Incheon? I arrived there about the first week of October of 1952. And uh, tell me about Incheon that you saw. How was it? Well, we got off the ship at night at high tide during the night, and I didn't see anything. And they put us on trucks and took us to Ascom City and went through the gate into the compound. And the first thing that hit me was the smell, the odor. Because everybody was cooking outdoors. No one lived inside. There was nothing. There was huts. Huts was all, you know. And uh, the, the, and then the smoke, the smoke just hung in the air, you know, at, at nighttime. And that, that was the first time and they said, get used to it, you're going to smell that for a while, you know. What kind of it's smell a, was it's it? It's just a, a strange odor. It's just smoky, uh, might have been some cooking, it might have been some sewage. It's just, just a, a, a weird, weird, weird odor. Yeah, that was the first, and it was dark when we got there. So I woke up in the morning in daylight and looked outside and this, looking outside the compound, the, uh, there wasn't much there. You could see walls, parts of walls, chimneys, you know, just here and there. But it, it was just, uh, it was just, it was different. It was strange. I mean, to be honest, it was mm. like a, something very foreign and very oh, yes. Yes. It's different. Yeah. And, and it was military, but then outside the gate was everything else. And uh, business went on, the ox carts went by, and the, the Papasans, the Papasans really fascinated me. They, they were like, like uh, royalty. And they're all nice and white with their black caps on and their little pipes, you know. And uh, we figured it must be a mayor or something. You know? Yeah, right. And, and, uh, and it, it, was, it was very strange and it was, it was new to me because I had never seen anything like that before. It's amazing. So from Incheon, where did you go? From Incheon, uh, the, uh, I was, for several weeks while waiting they didn't know how they were going to get me to my unit because they were way up there and there was only one track of train going up to Yonchon and uh, they didn't know if the unit was going to send a vehicle down to get me. So they temporarily, till they found out, they assigned me temporarily to a helicopter repair outfit which was close by and every day there for about a week and a half I'd go in there and help with the maintenance on helicopters, which I knew very little about. But I, I was able to do mechanical work. And then one day they called me in to the, the, uh, the office and they said, get all your stuff, you're gonna get on the train up to your, your unit. And so I got on a the train, then they pulled me off the train and said, no, there's a truck coming to pick you up. You know? So back to the compound again. Anyway, again, I took a truck ride, bouncing in the back of a truck, and dirt roads, gravel and dirt, and it was late in the day and it got dark and we're still going and I didn't know how far north we could go and still be in the same country, you know. Mm -hmm. And we arrived at my unit headquarters after dark and uh, hadn't eaten all day. Mess hall was closed. They gave me a sleeping bag and told me to go to a certain tent and find a spare bunk and sleep for the night. And the next day they'd process me. What was your again, unit? Again, it was cold. It was October. After dark, as soon as the sun went down, it was cold. And uh, I spent a very bad night the first night because I did, just had no idea what I was going to do. And 
Let's see. Next morning, I went to the mess hall, had a good breakfast, went into a supply sergeant. He issued me a rifle, an M1, and uh, uh, I wasn't an infantryman. I was an airplane mechanic. And uh, they said, your transportation will be here in a little while. We'll call you as soon over the loudspeaker as soon as it comes. A little while later, an airplane came and circled the field and landed on a little piece of gravel road. And he said, there's your ride. <laughs> and uh, he said, he'll take you up to where your unit's stationed. He said, the aviation de section was, was uh, detached from the main unit and combined with I Corps. But what was your unit? The 159th Field Artillery. And that belongs to where? That was uh, it was a uh, battalion of artillery that was detached from the 25th Division and attached to I Corps artillery. I Corps had taken a, a battalion of artillery from about seven different divisions and combined them on one little airstrip up there at I Corps artillery, which is just west of Yonchon on a plateau there. They built a little airstrip there and they had about Oh, they had about 14, 15 airplanes based there at that one strip. And uh, What was your rank? My rank at the time was private first class. <laughs> and uh, the, uh, I was sent up there. The reason they had changed my orders and sent me up there is because the sergeant who was the crew chief and section chief for the 159th was ready to rotate back home. And they had a vacancy there, and they only had one other mechanic, and they were supposed to have three, and uh, the other mechanic was also a PFC, and they just needed, to, and it happened at the time, it was an emergency, the sergeant that I was replacing was in the hospital for surgery, so they were really short-handed, and they needed to get somebody in that unit to, for, to fill the space. And, How uh, much were you paid? My pay, based on a 24-hour day, seven days a week, was two dollars and ten cents. Was ten cents an hour? Okay. Two dollars and forty cents a day. Two dollars and forty cents for 24 hours. A seven, day. Yeah, for seven days a week. So it's about eighty-two dollars a month, roughly. <laughs> what did you do with that? Oddly enough. Seven dollars of it came out of it to pay for my life insurance policy. <laughs> and I sent twenty-five dollars to my mother, and I sent twenty-five dollars to my girlfriend. We had a joint account because we were going to be married, and we were trying to build up some money. I sent it to her, and she put it in the account, and uh, the rest is what I used to subside well, I did write well. I did okay. It, so did you marry that? I did marry that girl. I still am. 63 years now. 63? Mm -hmm. Endangered species. Yeah. Yeah. What's her name? Her name is Shirley. Shirley. S-H-I-R-L-E-Y? Right. Shirley Bombardier. Shirley Bombardier. I wish I could see her. I met her when we were 15 in high school, in the second year of high school. So high school sweet, sweetheart. Mm -hmm. That's a beautiful story. Yeah. What was the most difficult thing during your service in Korea? That's hard to say. I don't, I don't recall any most difficult things. I guess the most difficult thing was the basic training in the infantry division. It was rough. It was in hard. the state. In the states. But I'm asking in, you about in in Korea. Korea. In Korea, I. Uh, I mean, what is the thing that really bothered you or hated? You hated something. What other things that you couldn't stand that bothers you? Physically, um, mentally? I, I don't have anything that really bothers me. You talk about I, I the was, kids looking yeah, for anything looking to bad. eat in the waste dump. Yeah, 
and uh, the uh, but I have but as far as bothering me, nothing that uh, I laid awake at night worrying about. Like I say, I wasn't in fear of my life. I was in a support company. I was, we were supporting the fighting troops. I could hear it, but I couldn't see it. I could hear it at night. So you were in the rear area? The, about four miles behind the demilitarized zone, yes. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I could see it at night during the hostilities. I could hear the machine guns. And of course, every time my unit, which was based, my unit transitioned then from the 155 to the 240 millimeter, the big, the big cannons, and they were 10 miles behind us. So every time a fire mission was called, because we monitored the aircraft, we listened to the radio when they were calling in strikes, and they'd call in a, a round away, which is, it had been fired, and about a minute later we'd hear it go over, and it, it just whistled through the sky. Mm -hmm. And then 30 seconds later we'd hear the crumpf four miles ahead, you know, and uh, it, uh, but that was my, the, the, the extent of my involvement with the combat part of it. I could hear it, but I couldn't see it, and it didn't bother me. As far as, I didn't carry a rifle every day. I, I was working on airplanes, I kept my airplanes flying, and uh, I did my job. I knew I was there for a year. And I think the thing that bothered me, as far as bothering me, I think about the only thing that bothered me was um, waiting to go home, uh -huh. waiting to go home. The, uh, but the time went by quite fast. I was fortunate in that I was able to fly with the pilots two or three times a week, you know, and I went to different airstrips, met people. I always went with the airplane because if the pilot had to leave the airplane, I always stayed with the airplane. I see. That must to be keep, hard. To keep pilfering. Yeah. Because we, we you know, we, we carried good radios and everything. We had a, in our unit, in our little compound there at the airstrip, we had a two and a half ton truck that was loaned to the, the unit from i to do heavy hauling, fuel drums and everything for our airplanes. And we had that truck parked right next to our mess hall. And while we were eating lunch one day, it was stolen. Right, in, right from in, right there, right next to us. Took off with all the airplanes and everything. Jeeps and trucks went out. We never saw that thing again. Where could it go? Who took it, you know? But we lost a two and a half ton truck. Really? Right, right while we were eating our lunch, you Who know? Who took it? We don't know. We don't know. We don't know if it was North Koreans. We don't know if it was South Koreans. Where was it? Where was it, in Yonchan? Uh, at our airstrip there in, in, in west of Yonchan, just west. Of, we were about three miles from Yonchan. Wow. Off to the west, yeah. And you couldn't find that again? We never found the truck or hide in our hair. We never saw it again. Did you actually try to find it again? Oh, yeah, yeah. How can this be? Because this was within minutes. You know, we were only in there for 10, 15 minutes eating lunch, and the truck disappeared in that 15 minute time, and somebody took it from there. And, and drove off with it. And you know, that was wide open spaces up there where we were at. And <laughs> even from the air and everything, they... It's hard went, to understand. Hard to understand, yeah. But that was the only thing we had was the... the that was the most excitement. <laughs> <laughs> it's not exciting, it's a... Yeah, it's yeah. a humiliation. Yeah, that yes it is. It's a humiliating thing. And to have a two and a half... They didn't take a Jeep. And we had a lot of Jeeps. Each unit had a Jeep. There were about seven Jeeps there and uh, uh, that many three-quarter ton trucks, but one two-and-a-half-ton truck, the only, <laughs> the, it, was our, it was our workhorse, you know. My goodness. And, uh, well, we what was the aircraft uh, there, F-86? F the no, no, we, the, the, this, was a, this was a gravel dirt strip. It was a dirt strip and uh, it was just a spotter airplanes. The, the, spotter. The, yeah, the L-19 Cessnas, you know, the, bird, the bird dogs. What are you called? Bird dogs, the L-19. Yeah. L-19. L-19, yeah, liaison 19 model. Uh, it's a two-seat two, two airplane. The pilot and the observer was all that flew in it. And they would, they would get up there at 4,000 feet and 
over the lines and uh, pick to out spot targets, the enemies. spot targets, look for targets, and uh, actually sometimes they'd go three or four miles past the line because we could fire 10, 15 miles into the, into the rear. And, uh, but those were the airplanes we, we serviced, and we kept them flying seven days a week. Did you write a letter back to your family? All the time. All the time? All the time. Do you still have that letter? Some of them. Do you? Mm-hmm. Oh. And not those that I wrote, but those that, I, that, that were you written received. to me that I received. From your yeah. girlfriend, too, yeah. surely. Yeah, yeah. Wow. I, I wrote you know, in our website, there are more than 8,000 artifacts, like the letters that yeah. you exchanged. Yeah. If you want to give me your pictures and the letters, we can put it up there. I could dig some pictures up. Uh, the letters, I would have to read them first and yes. make sure there was nothing in there. Make sure that there. there are because no Because we rock. were engaged couple and... Uh, it's got to be PG-13, not rated. Yeah, <laughs> okay. Yeah, and yeah. if you want to do... I think teachers and students, they told me fascinating experience to read what they wrote back to each other during the war. And that attracts a lot of attention from teachers oh, yeah. and students. It's amazing. Well, yeah, for children to, th to, to actually... You don't think that, that people had a life before them, you know? And, uh, but we all went through our, our, our period of life and... Uh, and uh, you know, these are the questions that elementary school children ask veterans. Where did you pee? Yeah, yeah, right in the tube. <laughs> How was cafeteria? <laughs> McDonald's? <laughs> you know? Yeah. Things like that. So yeah. it will be fascinating for them to see the pictures because the picture that you took is different from the pictures that was taken by the, the press. expert yeah. press mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. They want to see Korea in your eyes 70 years ago. Yeah. That's what we are trying to do. So if you have those and if you're willing to, we'll love to put it in your page. So when people check in your website, they will be able to see your busboy, your, your letters. You know, it's a love letter. You know, it has to be, I mean, it will, Stay private, but still, the most of the contents is, I think there no problem to be open, you know? So yeah. it's your decision, you let sure. me know, okay? Mm -hmm. So when did you leave? October of 1953, uh, 52. 52 is when, 50 I, when I arrived in Incheon, yeah. So you I, were my there. Unit, I arrived at my unit on the 16th of October. So you were there when the armistice was signed. I was there when the Tell armistice was signed. Tell me about it. The day, the day, the day was a good day. Everything got quiet, and we moved. They moved. They closed the airstrip we were at, and they built Camp. I don't know if you've heard of Camp Saint Barbara. Camp Saint Barbara. They built it about uh, eight miles to the east of Yanchan, and uh, it's active today. Uh, the Rock Army uses it now. We don't use it anymore. Uh, they. We built that. We built that. Our in those three months. We built an airstrip there, and we started putting up our tents. Now they've got nice buildings there and everything. I've seen the pictures of Camp St. Barbara now, and it's quite different from when I was there. And uh, You saw the picture now? Yeah, it's online. Okay. Yeah, they're online, yeah. And uh, the, uh, from the air, I've seen the pictures from the air. It, uh, it's quite a bit different, but it was but Camp St. Barbara, it went military after the armistice. It went military. You had formations in the morning. You had uh -huh. physical exercises and a little bit of marching in formation. And uh, it went military, you know, pressed the suits and no more wrinkled caps on. And it uh, had to be all squared off and uh, it, went, it went military. But that happened right after I left. Uh, I left at a good time. It was, uh, so when you left Korea, what did you think about Korea that would have a future like this today? Not at the time I didn't think so because of the condition it was in. The rebuilding hadn't started and there's no way to imagine.
because it was a farm country. It was, it was really a rural country except for Seoul and Busan. The, uh, so there was no way for me to have any idea what, what would become of it. But over the years, I saw what happened and I have an excellent picture of Seoul now, taken last year I found online and uh, seeing all those buildings and high-speed trains. It, uh, it's, it's amazing. It's amazing that they could do so much when there was so little. It, uh, it's come a long ways. It's coming a long ways from taking the American beer cans and opening them up, flattening them out, and soldering them together and making siding for buildings, which I have seen not only in Korea, but in Japan the same way. And uh, it, uh, I, I think it's a good, I think it's a good thing that's happened to them because had the North Koreans taken over the whole country, well, it would, the whole country would be like North Korea is today. My, the picture that amazes me is a nighttime Google picture of the lights in South Korea as opposed to what's the candles burning in North Korea. Mm -hmm. It's just, uh, well, it just, I just feel we did the right thing. We did the right thing. Are you proud of your service? Yes, I am. Yes, I am. I would have loved to have stayed in but I had the foresight to, to think ahead and decide I did not want to drag a family through, through life in the military. If I'd have been stayed single, the military would have been fine. I, I enjoyed my work. I enjoyed my work. I, had, I learned my career there. When I got out of the service and married, uh, I went to school and got my federal licenses became a certified aircraft and engine mechanic and uh, I went through my whole working career in the maintenance of aircraft, civilian and uh, airline and, and all. And, uh, I, uh, it was, I, I, learned, I learned my career in the service. Yeah. It's a beautiful thing that came out of your service, which is Republic of Korea, 11th oh, largest yeah. economy in the world, yes. and its most substantive democracy in Asia. That's right. We just impeached our president. Yeah, well, that's... Unfortunate, but that shows the power of civil society. That politics work. Yeah, and... <laughs> but we don't teach much about it. In our no. world history textbook, oh, yeah. Yeah, Korean War right. is only about this one paragraph. There's not much in there. I mean, why is that? Why is it forgotten and why we don't teach about these honorable things that came out of your service? Why? I, I don't know. Is it because Korea, not because it's not Japan, it's not China, but because it's Korea? Uh, I really couldn't answer that. I don't, I don't know. I really That's why we are doing this. That's right. This is, this is a good thing. This is a good thing. I've read some of the, I've done an interview at the Handley Library uh, two years ago, and uh, this, and I've read some some of the interviews there, and a lot of the soldiers had much worse experiences than I did. I mean, there are those who really suffered. My best friend, he uh, he was a line soldier with the 45th Division. He was a mortar forward observer for a mortar platoon. And uh, in June of 1952, June 12th, the uh, North forces were running amok, attacked their location, and he allowed all his people to move to the rear, and he stayed to call in mortar fire for his, retreat, for his retreating troops and he was killed there in his, his position. And uh, that was the hardest thing I had. Oh. That was the hardest thing. When my mother sent me a telegram, I was still in the States at that time. And uh, three months later is when I left to go to Korea. That was the hardest thing I had to take. And, 
and uh, to have sp spent, to have done his duty and performed his, his job for a year in the day before, two days before going home. That's to, horrible. Yep, yeah, yep. Yeah. Um, Paul, that's why we are doing this, so that yeah. teachers and students can learn from you and then we are using it to make uh, contents in the classroom for the Korean War and modern Korea. And so that I just finished the big teacher conference. Uh -huh. 90 teachers from 22 states came down to Washington, D.C. and my foundation hosted them for three nights and four days. Mm -hmm. We provided everything, hotel rooms and meals but they learn about Asia, they learn about Korea, they're going to listen to this interview so that they remember what happened and what actually came out of your service, which is Republic of Korea. That's right. So that's what we are doing, and we're going to have another teacher conference July 11th to 14th this year in Washington, D.C. And I invited Korean War veterans to come so that teachers can have interviews and then sitting with us for dinner, mm -hmm. July 12th. I invited, uh, I, I, I asked Louis to, to, to bring his chapter members like yours, to, like you, to, to the dinner, okay? So I really hope to see you there. And, and I wanna thank you again for your wonderful witness about the Korean War. Is there anything that you want to say to this interview or any message to the young generation or uh, about your service? Well, the only thing I say, I, next week I am going to the Mercer School in Aldi, Virginia to do three periods of living history with the uh, middle school students there. This would be my third year going for that and I tell them the same thing. At their age, they don't know what they want to do, but the, for those who don't aspire to go on to college and just want to get out of school, the military is the place to go because they can learn a career in, in the military. What school are you going? What was Mercer, this? Mercer, Mercer uh, School in, Al in Aldi. In Virginia? It's Mil Mercer Middle School. In Virginia. In Virginia, it's down near Dulles Airport. You can invite the teachers to join our conference in July. Mm -hmm. They can stay in the hotel free. All the all everything's provided by my foundation, and they will have a chance to listen from the good speakers, and they will learn about my foundation. Yes, they are welcome. Okay. So could you... The librarian there at that school is in charge of this program, this history program. Please tell them. Yeah. I want to invite them. Could you do that for I me? I can do that, yeah. All right. Yeah. And uh, the, uh, this is my third year. The school has been doing this for eight years now for their middle schoolers. And the questions that the students ask are all good common sense questions. And then afterwards, a couple weeks afterwards, I got a, um, an envelope with about 12 letters in it written by students. And they, they had to be listening to me because all the things they mentioned were all things that I talked about, you know. Uh -huh. And, and uh, so they, they were getting the message. And I thought that was very, very nice. 